Thank you all for coming. Thank you um, for your interest. Uh, as Mark said, I'm in the French department. I'm also in the dean's office in LIS. But the reason I'm here today is that I really, really, really like Ted Rawls' work. And about a year ago, I wrote him and said, would you come if I can find the money? And um, as is the case for many things on this campus, it's done by, through a spirit of cooperation. And if you look at the handout, you will see that there are an enormous number of participating units the Art History Program, the, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Departments of English, History, Political Science, Sociology, Speech Com, the IPRH, the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities, International Programs, the Program in Arms Control, Program in Comparative and World Literature, Russian East European Eurasian Center, and the Unit for Criticism and, Inter and Interpretive Theory. And then there are, in addition, constant supporters from the officer, Office of the Chancellor uh, through the Vice Chancellor's offices and on and on, the Council of Deans, the Graduate College. It's um, a great pleasure to be able to present Ted Rall, who is a syndicated columnist and cartoonist. His work appears in over 140 newspapers. He's published a number of books, collections of cartoons, both his and other alternative cartoonists. He has, um, um, he has a, no a third collection of collective cartoons coming out next, next year. Yeah. Next year. Um, and he is, um, aside from everything else, an international expert in uh, politics, geography, and what is at stake in Central Asia. And he had a, an audience of 1,400 freshmen, not the most easily tamed lot. He had them in the palm of his hand yesterday for a, a global initiatives um, presentation in Follinger Hall. And they were just on tenterhooks. They had great questions. and. Um, so forth. So today, Ted is going to talk about the slow motion suicide of the American empire. And he'll talk for about an hour, and we'll have a question and answer session. And I've been asked to tell you that the question and answer session, when you want to ask a question, go to the mic over there, and we'll do that afterwards. So with no further ado, I'd like to present Ted Rawl. And join me in welcoming him to the university. Thanks. Thanks. Should I, uh, I guess I can walk independently of the microphone. That's really weird. Or what happens if you do both? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Would, it's like uh, the universe would collapse. Is this thing uh, on, or is that just, I just need to wiggle it? Okay, because I hear that. I saw that mysterious, uh, that ominous no signal thing. Okay. Um, so before we start here today, I, th I wanted to, uh, you know, I noticed this article in uh, Sunday's New York Times, well, two weeks ago, um, and my wife actually pointed it out, so I'm stealing this joke, this come from her. But, uh, you know, I, there's so much focus on what's going wrong in Iraq today. And uh, a lot of people are pointing to the, the bad strategy, the lack of pre-war planning. Um, and, uh, and other people are, are, are disheartened by the lack of armor and adequate equipment. And I just couldn't help noticing that, you know, if, if our men are going to use little tanks like this, um, you know, I, I think that we can get down to the root of the problem here. I mean, you know, I mean, if you were an insurgent, would you be really scared if you saw this? I mean, you know, I mean, it's cute. I mean, so, you know, I was just, I think that we all need to write to Congress and, and say big tanks, like we fought in World War II, was, is, you know, is what we need to, how we need to move forward on this. Endeavor. In all seriousness, um, I ha um, before I get down to uh, talking about the, um, the decline of the American empire, or I should say the slow motion suicide of the American empire, I'm going to show some cartoons because that's kind of what I'm best known for. And, uh, you know, we've got to, get the, uh, got to get the light humor out of the way before we get down to the depressing business of living in Rome around 400 AD. So um, the, here's, uh, I'm going to read through these. Uh, if you don't jump into the volcano, the lives of previous volcano bumper, jumpers will have been wasted. Then we have them, 2,000 sacrifices and still a drought. Maybe 2001 will do it. Oh, we have a missing. Then we have the uh, guy trapped in the pharaoh's tomb. Let me out, the pharaoh rotted away and he doesn't need me to serve him anymore. Finish the mission. But we haven't caught any seals in ages. But if we stop sending dudes off on ice flows, we'll catch fewer than none. And that's uh, my little uh, bush Eskimo there on the right. Um, 
by the way, I just want to point out that my cartoons are actually not drawn in stretch vision It's only in PowerPoint that they appear in stretch vision here. Um, here we have uh, Bush on the right. Sire, we can solve this illegal immigration problem. If we deploy the 150,000 troops now in Iraq along the 1,900 mile border with Mexico in eight hour shifts, there'd be one soldier every 70 yards. I called the Pentagon and they confirmed that the rate of range of an M16 rifle is 800 yards. So you could put a watchtower every 70 yards, right? So you see where I'm going with this. And then the guy disappears, the advisor disappears. Bush is like, you know, because there are no real smart advisors in the White House. Um, here we have uh, Bush's disaster relief. Obviously, I did this after Katrina. Uh, this, uh, by the way, um, is John Tierney of the New York Times. Um, new, or new Orleanians will adapt. They'll sell their extra water to drought-stricken deserts <laughs> or turn their new Venice into a lucrative water park. Or there's also outsourced disaster relief. Thank you for calling FEMA Bangalore. Which credit card are you using? <laughs> then there's trickle down. We're using food and water so to the well-fed. <laughs> We're giving food and water to the well-fed and hydrated so they can help the hungry and thirsty. And finally, there's faith-based disaster relief. The Lord sent water and he will also send evaporation. <laughs> Uh, here we, this was also a response to, uh, to uh, Katrina uh, here in the West Coast. Why should we pay for New Orleans? They were stupid to live in a hurricane zone. And we, the Midwest, you take the risk of living along a fault line, don't whine about earthquakes. Hawaii, surprise, Tornado Alley has low rents. Gee, ever wonder why? Northwest, like I feel really sorry for fools who live on a speck of sand in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Northeast, nature's mean. What did those stupid volcano victims expect? South, at least we're smart enough to live away from a terrorist target. And you know, unfortunately this cartoon works better if you see the whole thing because there's sort of this like circle thing that just keeps going on around and around. This is uh, every American liberal household this is it, Bush is going down. They all get away with it. They always get away with it. Um, this is, uh, you know, my wife, she's, uh, she, this, this, I did this cartoon actually uh, just as Playing Gate was starting to break. And, uh, and she, I was like, this is it, this is it. She's like, no, no. Uh, but here we have Osama versus W. Um, this is just after the 2000 mark uh, was achieved in uh, US troop casualties. Uh, added up the number of people that Osama, ad Americans that Osama admits murdering, which comes to 2,931. Uh, then the added up the number of Americans that Bush has murdered through illegal wars in Iraq, Afghanistan. And he did assassinate an American citizen in Yemen with a Hellfire missile. That comes to 2,356. Uh, he's driven up a net deficit over 10 year period of about $10 trillion and of course blown one CIA agent's cover. So your conclusions are that Bush is 80% as likely as Osama to kill you. And however, Osama is more trustworthy, especially with your money. Better looking too. Uh, this is the uh, takeoff of course on the, on the classic evolution of man drawing. Uh, this is the evolution of the American left. We start out with the Communist Party guy of the 20s, uh, moving on to the hippie of the 60s, the PC, I suck man of the, of the 80s, uh, the DLC uh, slumped uh, Paul Begala figure there, um, dipping his toe into the, into, and then finally DOA, the, uh, moderate, the, 20, the 21st century liberal, who is happy that Harriet Myers is kicking Republican, but was, was defeated by the right wing, who's fighting for us. Thank God for the right wing. They're kicking Republican, but something is wrong here. Okay, here's mortality, more, sorry, morality. It is kind of more, nice slip there, morality 101. A Middle Eastern man is killed while, while he's simultaneously struck by an Arab suicide bomber and a bomb dropped by an American plane. The plane was piloted by the victim's ex-wife who joined the military after emigrating in order to murder him with legal cover. 
murder lands you in jail unless you're in the military. Then you get a medal. The suicide bomber was a CIA agent who converted to jihadism after witnessing US atrocities while undercover. The bombing Fallujah, but only civilians live there. Okay, is the dead man a victim of A, terrorism, B, murder, C, collateral damage, D, fate? Pay the answers only, please. And uh, it's, you know, the whole point of this cartoon, I don't know if it really, obviously it doesn't work. You guys didn't think it was funny, fine. Um, <laughs> You try doing 200 cartoons a year, you see if they're all funny. Um, but uh, this, uh, this cartoon was really um, sort of, it was kind of just to show how the absurdity of the kinds of things that we're up to these days, you know? The fact that we even talk about, the fact that insurgency comes up in normal conversation is weird. Uh, this was appropriate penances for reformed Bush voters. Uh, I'm really annoyed, you know, like now Bush's popularity is 35%. Like, fuck them, okay? It's like <laughs> the people who change their minds, like, you know, like you needed to like vote the right way before, two th before November 2004. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just ludicrous. So this was a follow-up to a cartoon about uh, deposed Bushists. Uh, so the appropriate penalties for Bush voters are stripped of right to a lawyer in trial, give me my phone call. It's like, we'll sort it out when the war on speedism is over. Indefinite tour of duty in the Middle East. Still no body armor, men. Oh, and we still have, we have, we have orders to wear these Bush t-shirts on patrol. <laughs> Payroll deduction to pay off the Bush deficit. Uh, you, guess what, your paycheck is zero. Actually, the syndicate does this to me. When a client goes out of business, they uh, subtract all the money that they didn't get paid and I get these like zero paychecks, it's great. Um, no food until, Iraq, until Iraq's WMDs or Osama is found. I'm hungry, so are the people of Iraq, Bushy. <laughs> Forced to repeat unbelievably stupid stuff they said after 9-11. <laughs> Irony is dead, everything has changed. Liberals are traitors, we have to do something. Fight them over there or we'll have to fight them here. And finally, passport revoked for when the US finally disintegrates completely. Uh, this was America 2008 about the, uh, the increasing role of the military in civilian affairs. Uh, I did this cartoon after Katrina. You know, it's like the first reaction to anything that goes wrong in the United States. Avian flu, send in the military. You can't send in the military, it's a bug, you know. Uh, litmus test, um, this is how we define uh, where we stand on things. If you're a liberal Democrat, you say that the Bushies must, be, must go or resign or be impeached, and uh, liberals are like, if. Uh, moderate Democrats say, well, they should go if they're investigated. Centrists say if they're indicted. Moderate Republicans say if they're convicted. Conservative Republicans say if they're jailed, and the Bushies are like, go. <laughs> oh, well, there we go, I could have just done that the fast way. And anyway, so that's some of my cartoons from the last few weeks. Um, and of course, my solution for bigger tanks, remember, bigger tanks. Um, it's, uh, I just think appalling. So, um, you know, getting back to, uh, to the tank thing kind of did remind me of a, of a fact that's been glossed over a lot in the days after 9-11. If you read the 9-11 Commission report in the New York Times and Washington Post coverage of 9-11, immediately after, there was a factoid that jumped out at me. Uh, and that was that on 9-11, at the time of the first attack, the entire defense of the United States consisted of 12 Reserve Air National Guard planes, um, 12, to guard the millions of square miles of airspace over the, United, the, the continental US. So, and among those 12 planes, the exact number of planes that were in the air on 9-11 is zero. And so if you think about that, um, it's a very, it really says something about the United States. And, and what I would say is that um, it confirms what, what uh, Osama bin Laden told Robert Fisk in 1997. The US is a paper tiger. You know, we have, we're the world's wealthiest nation, we're the wealthiest nation that has ever existed but we can't even keep one plane in the air to guard the entire United States at any given time. And I got obsessed about this fact. So 
uh, I called up the Pentagon, and it took a long time to finally get someone from the press department to call me back. But finally they did. And I asked them, how much would it have cost, would it cost to have two planes for every one of the 48, lower 48 states, in the air 24 hours a day? And they said it would cost between 200 and 300 million dollars a year. And uh, just fuel, pilots, uh, maintenance, parts, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, so, and they said that the reason that they don't do it is because of budgets. And in fact, they still don't do it. Now, bear in mind that the, the tax cuts that Bush passed to will total $10 trillion. But they're not willing to spend the money to keep planes up in the air to defend the airspace of the United States. Um, I had a, uh, a friend who was uh, on, a pl on a plane that was uh, in deep trouble. The landing gear wouldn't come down. Um, and it was uh, in Iranian airspace. Uh, immediately upon notifying Iranian air traffic control that they had a problem, within, within minutes, MiGs appeared on each side and escorted the plane out of Iranian airspace, back out to the Central Asian Republic from where it come, the, had, had come, the Kyrgyz Republic. So Iran has better air defense than the United States does. So bear that in mind. The next time you hear Bush wants to invade Iran, remember, they're going to beat us. Um, Militarily, um, not the way the Iraqis are going to beat us, uh, just by bleeding us to death financially and, and through blood. Um, you know, I, getting it, it does everything right now is colored through 9/11. This isn't our, isn't my fault, right? It's it's really something that Bush decided to make the defining moment of our times, and so. You, you know, one of, the, one of the, I think a lot of liberals, a lot of progressives, lefties, whatever you want to call them, people like me who hate Bush, hate Bush for different reasons. And for me, what I, can, I tend to judge people, their, their morality and their reason and their logic based on the way, that they, the way I would respond to a situation that they were in and, uh, and, whether, and whether I could put myself in their position and do this and whether I might do the same thing. And after 9-11, we say, well, the United States faced a number of possible responses. Um, clearly, we could have, uh, we could have had launched an investigation of the attacks and tried to track down those who were involved directly or indirectly, uh, well, only indirectly, since all the guys who were directly involved died, um, and ideally put them on, on trial at The Hague, uh, at, a, at a trial of the, um, under, the international, uh, under an international tribunal. Uh, we could have launched military action against the countries that were responsible. Remember, we have 19 guys from Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Nobody ever talks about Egypt, but Egypt supplied 15 out of the 19 hijackers who were ethnically Egyptian. Um, they were, they were, uh, they were uh, living in Saudi Arabia in exile, but they were Egyptian. The group that carried out the attack was Egyptian Islamic Jihad, funded by Al Qaeda. So Egypt had a role there. The, the intelligence services knew about it. And they were mostly trained in Pakistan. Some were trained in Afghanistan, four of them. Um, so essentially, the culprits are Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. We could have gone after one, all two, all three of those. Um, or there's option C, military action against countries that were not involved in 9-11. Uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, maybe Syria, Iran now. Um, we could have launched a surgical strike uh, against, uh, that's, uh, that's a Clinton-type solution. After the embassy bombings in East Africa, he launched a missile strike against uh, bin Laden's training camp in Afghanistan. Uh, that, there's always that, that approach. And, uh, or we could have, I suppose, done nothing. Not a very, not, not a, I don't think, a very popular choice. Um, and, you know, I, I look at the, um, as the causes, you know, that, you know, you, the guys who, who did this to us, you know, what, what were they? What do they want, right? Well, you know, if you're the president, what do you think? You know, do you really think? Do you really think that he thinks that they did it because they hate our freedom? I mean, come on. Uh, or they're jealous of our lifestyles. You know, uh, they they want my DVD collection. Um, I mean, you know, they have they have DVDs. So they're just called video CDs there. Um, or it's poverty. You know, if it was poverty, why hasn't Mali attacked us? They're the world's poorest country, right? Um, it's, uh, why hasn't New Orleans attacked us? Uh, the, um, 
you know, and, and you know, then of course there's those of us who were talking about um, the the impact of the U.S. on people's lives in in, in the Middle East, uh, the propping up of corrupt regimes, the economic sanctions, even like the direct attacks, the bombings uh, that went on throughout the 90s against Iraq. Um, the and of course there are the there's the desire there's the ideological stuff the uh, desire to start a, to launch to recreate the caliphate that was uh, ended in uh, when Ataturk uh, d ended it in uh, in Istanbul in uh, 1920 um, and of course there's the there is I think genuinely a concern in, among the radical Islamists about the influence of American culture. On, uh, on, these, on these traditional, uh, what they view as these traditional cultures, uh, the effect of cinema and, uh, and, and music and all manner of per American perversion. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there's, of course, the, the, Osama, the, commonly, the common uh, Osama wish list of getting the U.S. out of Saudi Arabia, the U.S. out of Israel, uh, stop, the Israel you, an end to U.S. support of Israel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, all of this kind of all boils down to really when you, you know, it's just a big mess, right? And like what it boils down to is that the United States is attempting, to, is an empire. Um, Chalmers Johnson published a book recently called The Sorrows of Empire. It's his follow up to Blowback. Uh, didn't receive as much notice, I think, as it should have. Um, and he did a, ta he conducted a, a comprehensive tally of US uh, uh, force strength and personnel at military bases around the world. And what you come up with is just, he has this table that goes on for four pages of, of those numbers. There are over 550,000 full-time employees of the Department of Defense, not including US soldiers, who are stationed at military bases all over the world. Uh, they're a permanent presence. He could find very few examples of, these, of a US military base overseas being closed um, it's starting to happen now, but until very recently, once the U.S. came and established a base in your country, it was damn near impossible to, to get them out. They were the thing that wouldn't leave. And it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's just, you realize that you know, we are in the empire business here, especially after the demise of the Soviet Union. And the United States is, is at a critical juncture here. You know, we're, we're a neo-colonialist empire. And 9-11 is a, is a warning call, it, so it's a, it's, a, it's a warning to us. It's forcing us to confront whether we want to continue to be an empire or not. And if you look at all the, pre the historical precedents, whether it's the British or the French or the Dutch or the Spanish, everybody ultimately gets out of the empire business. And in fact, the empires that are just empires, and they're not just sort of doing it on the side, like Rome, they just implode. There's a, there's a sequence that, is sort of natural in um, empire, in the natural expansion of, of an empire where, um, you know, it's kind of like, almost like you see it in corporate America where uh, Starbucks or uh, some other chain will start to appear on every other block. Um, I lived in, uh, when I lived in, uh, in Manhattan in the 80s, um, Stefanel, which was a clothing company, um, I re it was all over the place. They had, and I, I remember one time walking down East Eight, West 86th Street, and there were two Stefanels in two blocks. And I'm like, you know, how many Stefanels does, does New York need that they need, you know, it's like I can't quite make it to 85th Street. Uh, it's like, you know, it's, I gotta have that green sweater right now. And, you know, and, but, but it worked for the investors because they could, as long as the expansion continues, you could keep going back to the investors and saying, well, you know, we, 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 uh, we're doing great. Last year we had 200 stores, this year we've got 300 stores. Look at us, we're expanding. But then you get to a point where you have to pay the, the rent to the landlord and it gets to be really expensive. And so even though, yes, your sales are higher than they've ever been, you really just, it's not worth it. Um, the French learned this when on the, on the political plane with Algeria. It was their last big adventure in, 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 uh, in, em in empire and one that's beautifully documented in, uh, in the film, The Battle of Algiers, which uh, ironically after 9-11 was screened at the Pentagon as, a, as an example of, uh, they were trying to, to sh it's, it was the right movie to show, but they, did, but they didn't explain to the people who were watching it why it was the right movie. They, they, they showed it as, a, uh, as, a, as, as an example of how you defeat insurgency uh, by 
torturing people, right? The French overtly admitted torturing people all, th all throughout the Algerian war. Um, my uncle served in that war and, and they, he confirmed it, they did, um, relentlessly. And of course, you know, the, obviously they didn't stick around for the ending of the movie because France had to leave, right? They lost that war. Algeria became independent. And in fact, it led to, uh, it led to, to pride throughout the Islamic world that, that France had been driven out. Um, it was, you know, it, it nearly bankrupted the country. It was, uh, um, it was a moral shame on the country. And, uh, you know, to, in, and in an ironic way, Losing the Algerian War is probably like one of the best things that ever happened to 21st century France because now they're no longer in the, colo in the, co in the colonialism business. They are, um, they are a country that has turned more inward. Uh, they've devoted greater resources to uh, domestic programs and although there's always a push from the right to, 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 to roll back that stuff, still compared to what we have here, uh, the average French person has just a social safety net that's extravagant. My, my grandmother's uh, French and uh, uh, whole her life, they, she, they didn't, when she started to become ill, they sent, uh, the government had a programs to pay her rent, to send, uh, to send a caretaker to her apartment so she didn't have to move to a nursing home. They took care of her until her very last day. Um, it's just not like at all like the way I'm going to be retiring, uh, eating, eating out of a garbage can. Um, thanks to a social security reform that will no, no doubt come under the McCain administration. Um, it's, uh, so, you know, you, you, you look at this, we're, we're at a path in the road here. We can go the French route and admit that we've lost. Colonialism doesn't work. We can look at Iraq and Afghanistan too. You know, Afghanistan is the other war that we're losing that nobody pays attention to, but that we lost the day we arrived and is still lost and will never be lost, never be won and there's no point. And so you look at Iraq and Afghanistan, 9-11, this is stuff that we shouldn't be involved in. And I'm not call and you can look at the, you can look at the European powers like Britain to some extent, but certainly I think France is a great example of how you can remain actively engaged in the world, but on a more surgical approach. In 2000, um, four French journalists were uh, captured in Afghanistan by the Taliban and, and uh, held in prison. And the French government sent an emissary, th uh, sent, them a, sent the Taliban a message through an emissary and, they, and it was very simple. They said, deliver our, our journalists to the Khyber Pass by noon tomorrow or there will be consequences. And, and it's like, there will be, the Taliban wanted to talk about it. The French didn't want to talk. And then, that, what that, that can only mean one thing, and it meant that paratroopers were on their way. They showed up at the prison, shot up the prison, got three out of the four journalists out alive, and that was that. They, you know, we waited at the Khyber Pass, they weren't there, we had to go and get them. And that's a surgical precision approach to foreign policy. You don't have to invade a country in order to throw your weight around. When people know that you can, that's enough. Um, the United States, however, seems to be presently embarked on a, on a very different course, I think. Um, and that course seems to be more the model of the part of the world that I spend a lot of time in, the former Soviet Union. Uh, Russia just didn't, just kept going. It kept expanding and of course, obviously, ultimately fell flat on its face in Afghanistan and uh, lied, got caught lying to its people after Chernobyl. Um, and it's, uh, it's a country that just didn't know when to quit. It, it wouldn't get out of the colonialism business. And it ultimately, and I'm simplifying radically because we only have an hour here and there are, you could fill a bookshelf with, uh, you know, the, the, the causes of the demise of the Soviet Union. But the point here is, do we want to end up like, this, like Russia today, which has become a gangster narco state, or do we want to end up like France, where wine is three dollars a bottle? I mean, <laughs> it's a, uh, and it really is the choice that we face. It's a, it's a choice. I mean, in a way, we're a victims, we're a victims of our own money. You know, in a weird way, um, you know, George W. Bush and his, uh, and and the Republicans' uh, notion of of starving the beast in a weird way has turned against them in a way that may work towards my end. 
Uh, you know, we're broke right now. The reason that we're not invading Syria or Iran is because we don't have any money and we don't have any men left to do it with. And so in a way, they starved the beast. They starved it so badly that even the Pentagon is broke. And so now they can't do it. And in a way, that's kind of good. Um, the, uh, we're, we're, we are, with the, they've precipitated this crisis where we're not able necessarily, it's dangerous because we can't respond to a real crisis, even within our own borders, uh, as we saw with, with, her, with uh, the two hurricanes recently. And um, it's, it's something that is, uh, Bizarre, right? I mean, it's this country is kind of like the situation that I found myself in um, uh, last year when I sold my cheap apartment in Manhattan and moved to an expensive house in East Hampton. My mortgage tripled, my utility bills went up tenfold, and yet, even though I make more money than I've ever made in my life, I have never been poorer. And so it, that's just the state of the that's the state of the nation. I'm a microcosm, right? I'm maxed out on my credit cards, um, and I've and I've got revenue like nobody's business, and it doesn't. It's not enough. It just doesn't make any difference. And yet, but what am I going to do about it? I'm going to sell the stupid house and move back to the city and live in Brooklyn in a cheap place, and and wonder what the hell I was thinking. Well, right now. We have that same exact ability. We can do that. We can, we can get out of Iraq, Afghanistan. We can stop propping up corrupt dictatorships. It costs us a fortune and some that aren't so, so ruinous. And, and, just, and, and just start devoting these, these precious resources to uh, educating our children. You know, For instance, free college tuition. It should be normal in a, in a, in a country with this wealth, uh, with this degree of wealth. Uh, it's, uh, A re, you know, retire, no, no one should have to worry about their retirement. Um, no one should have to worry about, uh, you know, getting, the New York Times recently did a pretty good, uh, in a very interesting series about people who, who, uh, who, want, who, are, uh, who fall ill and go bankrupt, even though they have health insurance. I mean, that would happen to me. I have health insurance, and, uh, but it only covers up to $200,000. Uh, my lawyer died recently of brain cancer. When he died, his total bills were $6 million. Um, you know, he didn't do anything particularly outrageous, you know, he didn't like go for very weird experimental treatments. And uh, you know, if he, if he uh, hadn't been a wealthy guy because of people like me paying him, uh, he, you know, he would have died bankrupt as well and left his wife impoverished. So it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's just stupid. Right? I mean, it's just stupid. If, if your friend was behaving like this, you would tell him, like, dude, what are you doing? You know? Stop it. Just stop it. Quit being stupid. And, uh, it's, and I think that we really need to look at the European model, the, the post-colonial model. Um, you know, it's a model that's, uh, that's marked by incredible economic growth. You know, how many people know that, you know, the, that, the, that France, their efficiency, per, uh, the, the efficiency of a French worker per capita per hour is 50% more than that of an American worker. You know, and, and like you'll read articles by, by, uh, by conservative pundits who will say, talk about how inefficient the old Europe is and, and how the European, you know, European economy has to be radically revamped and be, become follow the American model. But you know, business doesn't think so. They get, they get, a better, they get more efficiency out of, uh, out, of the, uh, out, of, out of French workers, out of German workers than they do out of American workers. Um, and I think that, you know, we have to remember that uh, at the same time, you know, I, I think that you wouldn't want the United States to vanish entirely as a, as a force for um, internationally just because you wouldn't want to create an over, a power vacuum as we've seen. We've seen what happens in Afghanistan and Iraq when you take out a strong, uh, a strong force. Essentially, we are the world's Saddam. Uh, we, we get to, uh, we, we are holding down a lot of, of, a lot of things from exploding that need to sort of have, that where the pressure has to be released slowly over time instead of just overnight. But still, the move should be more inward and we should be, um, I think, taking care of our own a little bit better. And, uh, and we always have the, the surgical engagement option. Um, the French recently, uh, you know, the French feel, feel as an example very, 
free to uh, interfere in nations like Ivory Coast or uh, whenever their former um, African possessions, whenever something untoward goes on or something that just doesn't agree with their business concerns or whatever, they feel free to, to fly in and, uh, and do a quick, in cooperation with the UN, a quick little police action. And I'm not saying you know, that really even what the French are doing in Ivory Coast is right, but the point is that it's an option and it's a way of, of, it's a way of conducting foreign policy that is in a post, it's a more mature post-colonial kind of way. Um, you know, meanwhile, um, so, so in a way, I think, you know, despite the fact that I've like, spent the last five years and the last 35 minutes bashing Bush, um, you know, he's presented us with this amazing opportunity to, because this, these policies didn't begin with Bush. They've just accelerated and, they, and he placed them in really sharp relief. The United States has always reserved the right since Teddy Roosevelt to push the rest of the world around to, to bomb whoever we want, to kill whoever we want, to get whatever we want. And now we're, we're seeing that it hurts sometimes. For, it'll hurt us. We can't just keep doing it. And, and uh, the, the Bush policy of preemptive war, uh, the detention, all that stuff has just accelerated under Bush. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's showing us, it's kind of, in a way, he is a cartoon. It's like I'm a cartoonist. And what I do is I take real life situations and I expand them to say, well, like, at their most ludicrous, you have the example of the, um, you know, the, two, the, the let's sacrifice the, another, you know, the 2,001st soldier in order to get the, to get the bigger, har to get the better harvest, right? Um, and you, ex you just exaggerate in, uh, in order to, uh, to, get, to get to the truth. Well, Bush has exaggerated pre-existing natural imperialistic trends and made them so that really nobody who's a fence sitter can fail to notice it. And, and that's good because uh, those trends were there all along and it's forcing us to confront a problem. Uh, you know, you used to have a slow burning electrical fire. Yeah, well now, you know, the flames are shooting through the roof. You better call 911. So it's, it's uh, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing at all. And, um, you know, on the other hand, uh, we're uh, still casting about, you know, in a, in a very evil way. I mean, I was, uh, yesterday's Central Asia is, of course, um, the, th the uh, part of the world that I'm most interested in because uh, I think it's the new Middle East. Um, it's, uh, that's the book that I'm working on right now. It's coming out in the spring. Um, it's uh, just about that. And uh, you know, yesterday, the, the New York Times had three articles about Central Asia. One was about prison riots in Kyrgyzstan. One was about uh, the State Department for the first time issuing a human rights rebuke um, against Uzbekistan, our, our ally in the war on terror. <clears throat> most renowned for uh, massacring 550 civilians earlier this year and also for uh, boiling its political op opponents to death. Oh, and also uh, putting them into psychiatric institutions the way that the Soviets used to do uh, during, uh, and uh, you know, like, look, he's insane. Well, he is now. Um, and uh, so finally, Condi Rice, uh, got off her button and issued a very polite, like, could you please look into the political dissidents and if you find any that are being boiled, could you please just let, get back to me? Well, you know, your convenience, take your time. And it's, uh, you know, no rush. Uh, you know, it's the weekend over in Uzbekistan, I know. And it's, uh, but, it, but it is, it, it's, uh, it's, all, it's all coming to the surface now. And uh, it's, um, you know, we, we're, we, we haven't gone too far. You know, this isn't like the polar ice cap. You know, polar ice cap is gone. I, I don't know if anyone saw that piece in the Times. It's like, just blew me away. I, like, like getting hit in the stomach of scientists believe that the, even if we stop driving like today, it wouldn't matter. The, the process has begun. The energies in the atmosphere, the, the polar ice cap is, is gone by 2080, period. It doesn't matter. And, you know, it's, we're not at that point yet. The process hasn't, I don't think, arrived at that point where we're doomed. But, uh, you know, I don't want to live in Russia. Uh, I, I want to live in France where the wine is $3 a bottle. And, um, you know, uh, oh, oh yeah, I guess I should get into my positive stuff. I was, um, <laughs> you know, I wrote, um, two years ago I wrote a book uh, that was a, a book of, uh, sort of response to my mom. My mom said, all you ever do is criticize. I'm like, that's my job and my nature. And, 
and it's your fault anyway, you raised me. And, 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 and so I wrote this book that is just uh, Wake Up Your Liberal, and it's just a complete domestic policy, like how the Democratic Party and the left in general, could, sh what the things that they should do in order to, to respond to the, the current state of affairs politically. And um, you know, I'm on the sort of back burner right now as a follow-up on the foreign policy. And so I haven't really gotten to it yet because of the Central Asia book and also the, uh, the, the anthology that, that, um, that Lawrence mentioned. But I've, I've uh, still, you know, there are things that we could clearly do that would be, I think, and I think that the most, the most basic principle is for, it's what goes on in your mind. We have got to abandon the notion of American exceptionalism. The United States is just another country. It is no more important, right, better, cooler, smarter, hipper than Malta or Belize or Angola or any, or any place or the Seychelles. Well, the Seychelles are cool, but <laughs> the, um, you know, uh, the, there's, we have, we are not special. We are just not special. Just because you happen to be born in a particular place doesn't make that place cool. And, um, you know, it, it makes about as much sense as the fact that I grew up, you know, in, in Dayton, Ohio, and I rooted for the Cincinnati Reds because it was nearby. Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, politics is not a team. Patriotism is, is not something that, uh, it, you know, not, it should not be, um, shouldn't just be automatic. You should love your, you know, you should love your, your, your government because they do what's right, not because you just happen to be subjugated by them. And, uh, and we need, and I know it's like a big seismic psychic shift that will not happen because humans aren't that way. But we've got to at least start thinking that way. And, uh, and we need to start, we need to get back to the, to the uh, direction of, uh, of greater internationalism, working with the United Nations and other countries, um, and, and really just not thinking that when, when something goes wrong somewhere else, you know, to think, well, let's turn to the military and send them there and they will fix it. I mean, you know, after the tsunami, we sent the military. It's like, it's, it's a wave of water, okay? You don't send troops. They can't help. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just, this, it, we just, I don't know what's wrong with us. You know, 9-11 made us crazy. It's just what bin Laden wanted, isn't it? I mean, he really just wanted to make us nuts, and it worked. Um, so uh, I just want to make sure I didn't leave anything out. You know, is it, hey, reading off the bullet points, was, was this or reading a speech? So um, I know myself, I hate watching spe people read speeches, because I'm like, they could have just emailed it to me, and I could have stayed home. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. I would, you know, I like, I think we could go to questions. Um, it's a little early, but whatever. So if anyone has any questions, please step to the microphone over there. Don't use military force to get there. <laughs> The admonition you're using there is we shouldn't resort to military force, but your solution to 911 was we should have more National Guard planes in the air. So, I mean, I understand there's irony there, but the reason we didn't have any is because we really don't have any enemies that can attack in that way. We weren't expecting, or some people weren't expecting jetliners. So, um, the other thing, he says it's bankrupting us. Well, you know, there's an elite in this country that it's not bankrupting. Uh, last time I checked, Cheney's uh, deferred compensation is. Uh, has gone up from uh, 60,000 to 1.2 million from his Halliburton deferred compensation. So they're doing fine. They think it's a success. You know, they don't, they don't care about all the deaths. It's, it's, it's going fine for them. They've got their bases in Iraq, and uh, we've got bases all over your specialty area, Central Asia. So they're, um, thanks very much. They're doing okay. So. Yeah, I mean, you've, uh, you know, on the first point, uh, you know, obviously, as long as you have a nation state, uh, one of the defining fact, facts that defines a nation state is your ability to guard your borders and, uh, you are, and to issue currency and a few other things. And we, in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the causes of action in one of the torture memos for defining uh, the Taliban as a, um, a 
as, a, uh, as enemy combatants rather than prisoners of war was that, that, that Taliban Afghanistan was a failed state and therefore not covered by the Geneva Conventions. And one of the reasons that they were, according to Alberto Gonzalez, that they were not considered to be, that should not be considered to be a, uh, a, a real nation was because they couldn't defend their borders from incursions. Um, you know, I'm like, has he been to San Diego lately? But uh, the, the, um, I do think that as long as you're in the business of having a nation state, with which the United States is in, and you know, if you're calling for the abolition of the United States, that's fine. But as long as you know, we want a United States, you're going to have to defi You are going to have to guard your borders. You are going to have to have a military. You do have to have some kind of national defense. Um, and I think uh, it's pretty pretty damn stupid to have 12 planes all well, on the ground. If I might refine, time. if I might refine my point, I wasn't yeah. making the point that. Uh, you know, it was a civilian aircraft that attacked in that case, sure. 911. So we weren't attacked from outside. Uh, but I'm just saying, the point is that we are the biggest. We spend more than anyone else in the world, all combined, on military. Uh, um, we didn't have any enemies that were going to attack by that. That we needed to scramble far. But, but but you know if you but it's but it's on that particular day. It's it's well it's obvious that if there were planes already in the air. Uh, it scattered over the over appropriate density, that it would have been possible to shoot one or more of these planes down or to escort them somewhere. Which, right? which isn't a very satisfactory solution. We could have stopped them if we were monitoring, you know, all of the memo gates and the listen to Colleen Raleigh. We could have done all that, and that would have been more more effective too. But it seems to me the Syrian government has actually said, "You're saying what we say about you." This this report to, from the UN said it was such an elaborate plot they must have known about it. <laughs> Now, where have right. you heard that before? <laughs> yes, well. I mean, I'm not saying that they knew about it in advance, but, uh, but I'm right. just saying that's the turnabout's fair play, it seems to me. Well, but then you get into playing their game. I mean, you know, I mean, the thing is that the very, nobody's ever going to be able to prove that, that, uh, that, that Bush and the administration knew that, that 19 guys were going to hijack four planes on that day at that time. I mean, did they know something? You know, it's like if I say, look out, something's going to happen. Well, that's not very specific, and I think you know if you read those those warnings, uh, that's kind of what they had. I mean, and I can't believe I'm playing like apologist for the administration. <laughs> but, um, well, but, you're you're agile at it, and I'll thank you and let's you know. Say, but, I mean, but the I'm other just, point I'm just about saying, their, it's never been proven to anyone's satisfaction. Yeah, you can't prove it the other way either, though. Actually, you can't well, prove that they didn't have some kind of advanced knowledge. But then you get of into something happening, a, a hijacking. Simply, but the point that I'd like to go on is they're winning it from their point of view. They are, this is, a, we see it as a de devastatingly terrible strategy, but from the people that are p putting the chips on the, on the planet, you know, uh, uh, the 900 bases around the world, Camp Bonsteel in Kosovo, and all that that, uh, uh, what's his name, Soros of Empire brought up, you know, they are, they, they see themselves as having a winning game. Well, it didn't work out exactly they wanted it to, but, you know, they're, so uh, we're, we're saying that we feel so defeated. Uh, that it's not going right. Well, they don't, they don't care. Right, well, that, that's just because they're out of their minds. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, if, you know, Dick Cheney, assuming he survives his, you know, 17th quadruple bypass operation, is, is not gonna take it with him. But we're all gonna be stuck with the, uh, you know, with this mess for years and years to come. And, uh, you, you know, I mean, the, the bigger picture is, yes, obviously disparity of wealth is increasing in this country and it's benefiting the elites and uh, you know they're trying to turn this country into a into a third world country right I mean and it's you know obviously what's hilarious about it is that capitalism does eat it does eat itself um, you know ultimately the middle class is the engine of prosperity in modern economies and if you kill it uh, you just you then the wealthy become less wealthy and secure over time but they don't think that way. They only think about their quarterly profit statements or, and, uh, or, or yesterday's close on, uh, at four o'clock. So there's just, um, there, um, so I, I largely agree with you on that point, but I think on the, in the broader sense, the country itself is in, overall is, you know, our balance sheet just looks like dirt and it's, it's getting worse and worse. Um, I actually saw your lecture yesterday, too. Um, and oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> huh? That was okay. <laughs> um, and it seemed like a kind of like theme through that one especially, and to a lesser extent this one, too, um, was kind of that the things that the government says they're doing 
don't really have any matchup to what they're actually doing or the reasons behind what they're actually doing. Um, I, I know like yesterday you gave the example of um, the Afghanistan war and you know today you gave the example why are we fighting the people that we're fighting when they're not really the people who we should be fighting I guess. Um, and if I we should just, be fighting anyone, right. <laughs> I was just wondering if there's any any current example of things that the government's saying that you think actually are, are true. <laughs> Lecture over. Um, well, I mean, you know, politicians lie, right? I mean, it's kind of what they do. It's their jobs. And, uh, you know, it's kind of European members, you know, citizens of every other country understand this. I don't understand why it's hard for Americans to understand that politicians are liars. Um, and uh, they think that their job is to protect uh, to protect all sorts of interesting and tasty info tidbits from from us who pay them, um, you know. In, in ter I think you know it's like often in the in all seriousness, I think that it boils down to what they leave out most of the time. You know, there's always some kind of crucial component. Um, you know, like if you say, well, were there you know there were terrorist training camps in Afghanistan? Yes, there were, um, but you know, there's so much more than that. Like. You know, most of them were in Pakistan. Um, they leave that out. Um, Osama bin Laden was in Afghanistan. Yes, but not on 9-11. Um, it's uh, in, you know, there, Saddam Hussein used uh, weapons of mass destruction on his own people, mm, probably only in the process of shooting at the Iranians, right, during the Iran-Iraq war. The, you know, the great founding myth of Saddam as as a genocidal curd killing maniac is, uh, you know, kind of really unproven. Maybe true, you know. I think it's re remarkable that, you know, a guy like Saddam, who is a horrible, tyrannical dictator, uh, is some someone that the administration feels it necessary to slander further beyond his actual crimes. Um, you know, like what? He's not bad enough. Oh, but oh, all the bad stuff that he did, he did with your funding and backing. So. Uh, you have to find something else. Um, the, 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 you can just look at a million things. It, you know, there's a social, Bush will say there's a social security crisis. Yeah, there's going to be if, uh, you know, there, there's a funding issue. But how to resolve it, of course, is not that way. You know, he's kind of like the doctor who can, who will sort of diagnose something wrong with you. Uh, and sort of just, uh, you know, assigns like some quack cure to, to everything. Um, so, you know, in short, I don't think that the government is, uh, is generally in the, in the business of telling you the truth. They're kind of in the business of looking out for themselves. And it's up to people, uh, for, up to citizens, to hold them accountable. And uh, that's where, you know, we've been falling down on the job. I mean, uh, you know, I do a lot of cartoons that criticize Bush, but I also do a lot of cartoons that criticize us because we're just, like, I, mean, I could join you too. We're all sitting down, right? Like, while well, those guys are running the show, we're like, we've uh, essentially, we've outsourced governance. Um, it doesn't work very well. It, it sounds like most of what you've been talking about uh, regarding American empire is a particular model of empire that of, uh, you know, the neoconservative Bush clique, you know, doing, you know, direct heavy military interventions. Yeah. Uh, and I think you're correct in identifying that as, as unsustainable and terminal and, and ultimately, you know, catastrophic. Uh, but I'm, what I'm wondering is if you could talk a little bit more about what you might call sort of a neoliberal version of American empire, you know, a la the Clinton administration or the G8 and, and Bono and, and all of that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not uh, Bono. I mean, in, 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 a way, in a way, it seems like that's a particular model of empire of, yeah. of securing American domination that does not rely as much on this kind of naked military force, but is more insidious. And, and it seems like sort of the more long-term, uh, more serious problem than the Bush administration. So I'm wondering if you could, if you could talk a little bit about that and, and if, if that model of empire is suicidal or not. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think that... That is a, a more insidious model of empire, and it continues apace. You know, there's a new free trade agreement of the Americas. There's uh, free trade agreements with uh, just about every every industrialized and non-industrialized society on Earth pretty pretty soon. Um, and yeah, the neoliberal model continues apace. Um, uh, it is ultimately, I think, um, as uh, maybe as unsustainable, but over a much longer period of time. I think the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, what it ultimately does is drag 
uh, the US and other modern, um, I should say, um, wealthy countries down to the lowest common denominator of, of working conditions and incomes. And because, you know, it's sort of logical, right? I mean, it's um, capital is, has become incredibly fluid. You can open, you can, uh, if you're a business person looking to open up a production facility, you can find, you can put it anywhere on the planet where you can find qualified workers to make what you want to make. And, uh, and you can, and, and so therefore you're looking obviously to minimize the, your labor costs and, and, uh, and not have to worry about working conditions and environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you get down, but then at the same time, we're, as people, labor, is trapped in, uh, in these nation states. You know, we can't, if I hear that the highest per capita income in the world is in the UAE, um, and I remember when I got out of college in 85, it was in Qatar. Uh, I read that somewhere, that they had the highest per capita income in the world. And, you know, I wasn't really liking you know, the U.S. that much, so I thought, <laughs> You know, I'll tell go move to Qatar. So I wrote to <laughs> to the embassy to ask about job opportunities. You know, I was like, I could make ninety two thousand dollars a year, average. That's great. And of course, you know, there's no way to do that. And it's um, you know, and and people would probably be very even if you got rid of all borders and created a uh, a unif we have a global economy. But even if you created a global political um, nation state kind of sequel global one world government kind of thing. Um, people still wouldn't be fluid because they're, 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 they, would be, they would have to deracinate themselves from their ties to, uh, to their families, to their cultures, to their language, to et cetera, et cetera. And, and so you know, people are never going to be as fluid as capital. And so obviously it just pushes the, the, overall, um, the overall trajectory of, uh, of, everybody's li of ordinary people's living standards down, 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 down to the lowest common denominator. So it might not be so much the U.S., not just imploding like Russia. It might just be more like the US making a slow fade. And in fact, you've seen that in the last 20, 30 years. You have seen living standards slowly decline. People, you know, they're working longer hours. They're, they're accruing more debt. They're burning through their savings. They're taking out loans on their retirement. But it's, you know, it's, it is ultimately unsustainable. But it's kind of the difference between being fired and just taking a 5% pay cut every year. You sort of end up dead in either, in either case. But it's, uh, you know, it's just sort of you're going out slowly. I think it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a huge issue, you know? I mean, it, and, it's, uh, and it does ultimately boil down to that. The reason that free trade does not work, and I've had this discussion with, with people who are huge pro, pre, um, free trade proponents, and they kind of agreed with me, is that there's no way to, to put the, the balance between labor and management, labor, and, labor and, and capital, into any kind of working balance. You can't, you know, labor is increasingly disorganized, and capital is increasingly um, agile. And it's, it's just huge. It's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, you seem to uh, advocate uh, surgical operations as a means of intervention into things. I was wondering, like, in the French operation that you gave, they go in, they get the three or four journalists, and then they leave. Yeah, um, exactly. I was wondering, in the, in the use of that to stop uh, problems, like, yeah, you got the four journalists out, but there's still the, the people that took the journalists are still there. And so if you're using it to curb things like uh, the acts of uh, genocide in the Darfur region of Sudan, or if, you know, historically, if you were to use the 94, like, you, can you use a surgical operation to, to uh, stop things like Rwanda from happening, or do you need? No, I don't. I don't think you it? could. Um, I, I think that in a, you know in a case where um, you know, like Darfur or Rwanda or arguably um, Kosovo, Kosovo, Albania, you would not be able to. Uh, you would need. You need a broader force. Um, you need some kind of uh, some kind of broader intervention. Um, a, you know, a police action of some sort, in, ideally with international legitimacy, uh, because you know, in a way, you kind of don't want to. No one nation should want to take the blame for this. Uh, if you go in to interfere with someone's genocide, you know, they're really annoyed because they have all those people to kill, and you've stopped them from killing them, and now it's like they're going to have to wait till you leave, and they're just annoyed, and then they hate you, and then you know, it's that's not good in the long run. So you kind of want to diffuse the responsibility, and I think that's the reason that you want to work within international organizations. Uh, it's a uh, 
it's a I think it's, it's the only way. And by the way, I'm, I don't mean to say that I advocate surgical strikes like this. I'm not even saying that what the French did was right. I think that the truth is that if the French had had diplomatic relations with Afghanistan at the time, the, the whole situation might not have been necessary. They might have been able to, uh, to work, uh, to, the journalists might not have been arrested in the first place. Uh, the French government could have negotiate the ambassador could have met with the Afghan ambassador and maybe something more civilized could have been worked out but the point the broader point that I'm trying to make is that um, for those who do believe in intervention and the fact and the idea of, of expressing military um, expressing the American power through um, through military force as a backup my point is that it's not necessary to you know it's kind of like uh, when you're raising a kid right you don't have to just keep beating them up. I think if they know that you're bigger than they are, it generally works. Um, and uh, you know, it's enforcement through fear. And again, I'm not even saying that we should be in that business, but it's such a difficult mindset for the average American to accept that maybe we're just another country like Malta, that um, we that we are like uh, that. It's a, it's a transition. I see it as transitional and a lesser of two evils. Um, you know, I mean, we've killed 160,000 people in Iraq. I mean, you know, even let's setting aside whether it was a, you know, the causes of the war. I mean, surely there was a better way. I mean, 160,000 people. You know, if if you saw the bodies piled up outside, you just couldn't believe it, and it wouldn't be any less real than it is. I mean, any more real than it is. It is real. And uh, you know, in Afghanistan, at least twenty-five thousand. You know, I mean, this is this is carnage. You know, you want to stop a genocide? Uh, you know, who's going to invade us? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I would like you to comment uh, on the um, uh, uh, on the inability of the of the United States to produce its own uh, human capital to, to sustain, for example, its uh, you know high-end research uh, institutions, its cutting-edge technology. And it's a heavy dependence on on foreign uh, uh, human brain. And could that be uh, suicidal? Whether that influx of uh, foreign human brain stops? Well, to answer your last question first, yes, I, I think overall, what draws you know, why do people from India and, and Pakistan and other countries come to the United States to to uh, to, uh, to work or to to study? It's because the United States has economic opportunities, and with those opportunities vanish along with our living standards, then obviously um, the, uh, the, the decline of the empire will, the empire becomes a less attractive place to move to. Um, and I think, uh, so it, it's the, you know, I mean, I, I was taken by the word inability that you, uh, that you mentioned. You know, I mean, I know it wasn't, it, but, it, but it's, it's funny, right? Because it is almost, it is, we get back to the whole starving the beast notion. You know, I mean, the United States has the ability to fund research facilities and to uh, and and to make science and and and, and education a top priority. Uh, we have the we have the ability to fund our public and pri our public school system to the point that we wouldn't need to import uh, geniuses from abroad. Uh, we could just use the ones we have who are working at Texaco now and uh, and 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 educate them instead. Um, and it's, it's a choice, right? It's a very active choice that we make every second of every day of every year. And we choose to squander, our, to piss our money and our resources and our energy away on crap. Uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's, and you know, whether it's the, the, the cheese museum in upstate New York or the, or the, uh, or, or, or the ten trillion dollars in tax cuts to you know four people who don't need them, and or the um, or or obviously these stupid ass wars. Um, there's you know I mean we have we're not poor here you know the, we don't we have the ability and that's that's really my point here is that the American people need to rise up and demand what happened. I mean that's why Hurricane Katrina was so interesting. It's like it really marks the beginning of the end of the Bush regime, more so than the Scooter Libby indictment. Yay! Um, it's, the, the, uh, it's really about the, it's, a, it's, it's the, uh, because people finally saw for the first time, even though it had been true all along, that, you know, this is the United States government. What, it's like, it's weather. 
you know? It's rain, and like, it's big rain. Like, hurricanes come every year. There's no surprise about them. If you, anyone who's ever been to New Orleans knows that one of the subject of the leaky levees was a constant source of discussion in New Orleans and in their newspapers for years. There was never any mystery that this was going to happen. It was only a question of when. And, uh, and they chose, you know, the governments chose under Clinton and previous governments and Bush not to do anything about it. And here we are. And, and, and it opened people's eyes like to the fundamental question, which is a not liberal and not conservative question, but what the hell are they doing with our tax money? You know, I mean, if we lived in a country that, that had a tax rate of 2%, and, uh, and, the, you know, the Red Cro and then something bad happened and the Red Cross asked us all to send money, I think we'd all say, yes, we'll all send money. But we don't, you know, we pay, we pay a considerably more than that, between a third and a half, depending on what state you live in, um, of our income goes to the federal, state, and local government. And they don't do anything with it. And they can't, state, they, they can't give water to people who are in flood zones. So it, it drew, again, like the, you know, like it's, it's the, the crisis points out a problem that's been there all along, and it makes it obvious, and it goes down, and, and you know, I think people do need to realize that we have to have bigger, smarter priorities in the long run if, we, if we're to stand a chance to, uh, you know, to compete, and to com not even, I don't even like the word to compete, but just to sustain this country in, in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, you've commented in several different aspects of sort of the French uh, post-empire, uh, kind of the French model, and, and I keep coming back to thinking about the rioting in the Paris suburbs that's going on you know, mm -hmm. now, seventh, I guess the seventh night. And I'm just curious, it sort of resonates in a variety of ways. On the one hand, sort of the issue of the success or failure of the welfare state, as you commented. And on, on another hand, it, it sort of invokes sort of the French colonial legacy because, as I understand, many of the neighborhoods are North African immigrants, and then, of course, many of them are Muslim, and so there's this sort of West, you know, the, sort of neo-Crusades kind of issue, the, you know, Christendom versus, uh, uh, you know, uh, Islam issues that are all sort of invoked, in, I su suspect, in, somehow in those, in the, in the rioting that's going on. I'm just, mm. I'd love to hear you comment on it. I don't have sort of a political subtext. I just would like to know what you think about what's going on and how it sort of fits into some of the other comments that you've made. Yeah, I mean uh, the riots that are uh, that are happening in uh, in northern Paris, you know, in uh, Nanterre and uh, those other suburbs, um, you know, that I've been to, are uh, they are a they are a hangover of the um, of the colonial era. Absolutely, you're right, and the um, and they, you know, the thing that's hard to accept is that even if uh, you know, it's like even if you uh, stop smoking now, you might still die of lung cancer 20 years from now, right? Um, it's a uh, uh, and I think you know the the French the French system is is far from perfect, and uh, you know they have uh, the the uh, economic and the economic and political power of uh, of, of Muslim immigrants is uh, you know they're they're treated like crap, uh, and you you can just they they're they're shoved into housing projects, they're discriminated against in work by the police, um, and maybe their biggest problem that they have is that they're mostly disenfranchised. Um, it's very hard to to emigrate to to immigrate to France to to obtain French citizenship. Um, you know, you, if you sneak in and uh, uh, and and well, I, I can tell a story personally. Um, I have I'm a French citizen. My uh, my through my mom. I'm born in the United States, so of course I'm American. But also, uh, my my mom is uh, born in France, so therefore I'm entitled to French citizenship. And when I got my French passport, um, some of my friends in France were furious, and they said, you know, I've got friends who came here from Africa or whatever, or Turkey or whatever, 25 years ago, and they still can't get French citizenship, and, you just, and you're not even using it, and you just think it'd be cool to retire in the south of France, and, and, you, you know, and, and, and I was like, yeah, you're right. You, you got any friend I can like, give my passport to? You know? it's, uh, it's really, that's a big problem. They've created, um, it, they've made it very difficult. Of course, we have that same issue here in the United States, where we have, we have huge flows of migrants into the United States, um, so we, our borders are open and porous, right? Anyone's welcome to come, really. And uh, we make no attempt, as I showed in that cartoon, to guard that border. We don't care. Bus business relies on the cheap labor. It drives all of our, our prices down. You know, Pat Buchanan's right about all that. It's like, and then, um, the, and then at the same time, you make legal immigration almost impossible so that even people who are well-educated, even people who speak perfect English, 
basically, unless they marry someone and do the fake marriage thing, they're not going to get a green card. They're not going to be able to legally immigrate. And, uh, and so it's, you know, it's, well, what's the purpose of the system, right? I mean, the purpose of the system is to depress wages, to enforce, um, to enforce this injustice, to keep, again, that balance between labor and management always in favor of, of, of capital. And uh, it, it's, uh, and in France, they, they have that same issue. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, so I think it's, it really kind of boils down to the fact that these, you're talking about desperate people who have nothing to lose. Desperate people who do have nothing to lose will throw rocks at you. And it's, it's kind of really the oldest lesson in the book. And if you're smart, you never create desperate people with nothing to lose. Yeah. I was surprised a couple of weeks ago when you had a complimentary article about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> given the, her support for the war initially, yeah. and it seemed like there doesn't seem to be much of a future with all those old-style Democrats like Kerry and Lieberman and, and Hillary Clinton, and especially what they did with uh, Howard Dean in 2004. And I'd like you to comment on, you know, should, do they really deserve our support anymore, or do you have to go third party? Well, the system is, I think everyone here probably knows, right, that the system is really set up to, uh, to prevent a, three, a third party from taking off. I mean, the two major, I mean, you know, it's really weird. Um, you know, the, the founding fathers never anticipated a party system. Um, in fact, they were against it. And one of the columns I wrote last, last week was about that. Um, and it's, caused, it's led to all sorts of problems. And, um, the, and, and one of them is that the fact that, these, that the Democrats and the Republicans in the modern era have conspired to keep third parties off the ballots. In many states, for instance, you have to achieve some kind of threshold, 5 or 10 uh, percent in, in, a, in a ballot in order to get back on the ballot in the subsequent election, right? So if you start out with one, you can't start out with 1 percent of the vote and then, you know, build support and get to 2 percent of the vote, et cetera. That's not going to work. They, you know, it's kind of like winner-take-all politics. If you can come out of the gate like Ross Perot with millions of dollars to 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 uh, to spread your message, then yeah, you can. And if you can come out of the gate with 28 percent of the vote, then yeah, you can do it. But who can do that? So, the system, the two-party system, is something that, failing a revolution or some kind of some kind of implosion like the Soviet Union isn't going to go away. It's uh, we're stuck with it, and given that system, I mean, and I think it sucks. I think it's absolutely idiotic that a country with 290 million people, or I, I guess almost 300 now, right, are are uh, you know are represented by two parties that like on a political spectrum from here to here are like pretty much like here. Um, you know, it's 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 really stupid and it doesn't make any sense. Um, but that said, within that construct, uh, what I was, the point of my column was that in 2008, if nothing changes, but things will change. If nothing changes, Hillary Clinton and will probably be running against John McCain um, in 2008. And that setting aside the fact that, that Hillary Clinton is a reprehensible person who, because she voted for this war and she knew she shouldn't have, and you know, and she voted for the Afghanistan war, which to me is equally unforgivable, um, because of what I talked about earlier. Um, the, you know, setting that aside, I think it's really also, you know, it's like this is the choice that most voters are going to face. Given that choice, um, I know a lot of liberals who are who like John McCain, and and they, you know, he has a good story to tell, and uh, and they're tempted to vote for him. And, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that, look, we have an opportunity here to vote for a woman. Now, sh is she a good woman? No. But we have the chance to vote for a woman. And I think, and, and you know, I'm not, look, I'm, I didn't grow up as a girl in this country, but I guess that if I had, I would have found it terribly depressing when I first learned to memorize the list of the presidents in elementary school that there had never been a girl. I would say that that was, and I, you know, it's like as long as there's, there's only been wasp males, uh, except for one who was still a white guy and rich, um, uh, you know, who've ever been president, everyone who's not a wasp male is disenfranchised from the system. They look at it, it's very symbolic. I mean, you know, Sri Lanka has had a woman president. Pakistan has had a woman, has had a woman premier. Um, the, lots of countries have had woman leaders. India, I mean, you know, countries that we would consider not to be as advanced as us. And if the United States, if we elected Hillary, it would send this huge message to the world and to women that, um, and, and to girls, 
that they would have that there's this there's possibilities for them that don't exist that that right now. I think it's just I think it's purely symbolic. You know, I don't even believe in um, it's really it was really hard for me to write that column because I don't really believe in like say race and uh, and gender based affirmative action. I only believe in class based affirmative action. Uh, but that said, it's you know this this these are the choices that you have and. Um, and setting aside also the fact that John McCain would probably oversee the, de the demise of Roe v. Wade, um, you've also got just the fact that you have the chance to vote for a woman. She's not perfect by a long shot, and I've criticized her plenty, and I would criticize her plenty if she were elected, but it's a woman, you know? It's like, this is your chance. It's like, it's really important. We can't, you, you, we have to, I, th I think it's really important for, for, uh, for the public to, to do that. I mean, I remember it's very analogous to in New York City when we elected David Dinkins as mayor, um, African-American. You know, there'd never been an African-American mayor of a city with a very substantial African-American population. And he was a terrible mayor, but it was really important for us to have, we had plenty of terrible white mayors too. You know what I mean? Like, let's have a terrible black mayor. Let's have a terrible woman president. We had, we've had plenty of terrible male presidents. Most of them were terrible. So let's just get like the terrible, let's get into the terrible women president thing too. And that's well, all I can't kind of we have there. a good woman though, like Barbara Boxer or somebody like that who didn't vote for the war. And well, has. maybe, maybe, and do we talk to call Barbara? I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't have anything against it. I'm just saying that this is the way, the lay of the political lay of the land right now. I mean, you know, Hillary's really got all the stars in alignment, and more to the point, she's got the money. money. Yeah, I mean, this country, you know, these elections are all about money. Okay. <laughs>